This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidui Yort. It's Thursday, February 4th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of coronavirus, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VU headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on, and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Five children have become the first to successfully undergo heart surgery in Burkina Faso in what is hoped could mark a sea change for the West African country's struggling health system. David Doyle reports. Laundry Neal is one of the first five children in Burkina Faso to successfully undergo open heart surgery, a landmark event that doctors say could be a turning point for the country's troubled health system. <laughs> Shortly before his cardiovascular surgery last month, and the nine-year-old's mind was on the future. After the operation, I'd like to become a footballer like Messi. The aspiring soccer star had struggled with breathing problems. And his mother, Amandina Bilabu, says she tried traditional medicine before visiting a hospital where Laundry was diagnosed with a heart defect. It was then that he was selected by French charity La Chaine de l'Espoir as one of five children for a surgical campaign at Ouagadougou's Tengandogo University Hospital, in which European doctors led operations assisted by their Burkinabi counterparts. The charity's president, Dr. Eric Chesson, says the aim is to create a team in Burkina Faso that can carry out the operations independently. The impoverished country continues to face major challenges in its health sector, despite increased government funding and international interventions. Dr. Adama Sawadogo is one of the cardiovascular surgeons who took part in Laundry's operation. He says the learning process is slow in a field as complicated as heart surgery. He has 10 years of surgical experience. The European surgeon he assisted has 40. And it's that experience that prepares you for the unexpected as with laundry. When we opened, we found another defect that was left unnoticed. Patent ductus arteriosus. It resulted in more bleeding than usual. The surgeries were a success, and now all five children are recuperating, though laundry's recovery will be the longest. Two weeks after the operation, an infection that arose during surgery is keeping him confined to the ward even as the other children prepare to go home. Though a cardiologist responsible for laundry said his young age will help him get back on his feet. That was David Doyle of Reuters reporting. Former Ugandan rebel commander Dominique Ongwen was convicted Thursday of war crimes and crimes against humanity, including murder, sexual enslavement, abducting children, torture and pillaging in a ruling at the International Criminal Court at The Hague, according to Reuters. Judges at the ICC say Ongwen, who himself was taken by the Lord's Resistance Army as a young boy, had acted out of free will in committing the crimes between 2002 and 2005. Presiding Judge Bertram Schmidt says the evidence in Ongwen's case showed that sexual crimes were systematic and institutional under his command and in a legal first convicted him of the crime of forced pregnancy. Schmidt also said, quote, there exists no ground excluding Dominique Ogwen's criminal responsibility. His guilt has been established beyond any reasonable doubt. The ruling at ICC is the first dealing with crimes by the LRA, according to Human Rights Watch. It highlights the difficulty of trying somebody who is a conscripted child soldier is both an alleged perpetrator and a victim. More than 350 former Peace Corps volunteers and a trio of former U.S. ambassadors have written to U.S. congressional representatives, urging them to condemn the violence in Ethiopia's Tigray region, warning that as the fighting winds down, we are quite sure that the war will continue on a much more harmful level. The letter seen by the Associated Press also asked lawmakers to press for humanitarian aid to all parts of Tigray and urged the United Nations to investigate and advocate for media access to the region 
to document human rights abuses. COVID-19 testing tents are popping up in French capital as extensions of local pharmacies that allow people to walk in and get a free COVID screening. BOA's correspondent, Maria Madiello, has the details. The white tents are now a common sight in Paris. Here, anyone can get a free coronavirus test without an appointment. The tents were set up to avoid a crowd of people inside the pharmacy doing tests and to avoid mixing between people who come for their medicines, who are in good health, and others who come for tests and who could potentially be positive. The effort is possible because more rapid COVID-19 tests are now available. The rapid test results usually take about 15 minutes, a fraction of the time required for other coronavirus tests. Just stumbling upon it in the street, I think it's easy to go for a test because it's very accessible. It's a great initiative by the government to be able to get tested so quickly and have a result in five minutes. They were saying there's 1% chance it doesn't work, so it seems reliable and it's reassuring. Parisian Patricia Avzal says she came upon the tent and decided to take the test even though she had not planned to, despite having mild symptoms. I've had light symptoms for the past two days, a bit of fever, a headache. I'm sure it's something else, but because I came across it, it's quick, 15 minutes, I thought, why not? So I decided to do it. France has recorded more than 3.2 million COVID-19 cases, the sixth highest in the world, and more than 76,000 deaths, according to Johns Hopkins University data. Maria Madiello, VOA News. The first vaccines against COVID-19 have gone mostly to wealthier countries. Now several middle-income countries are getting their shots. Many come from Chinese and Russian drug makers. But critics note that these developers have not been forthcoming with data on the vaccine's safety and efficacy. Here's Steve Baragona has more. An indigenous nurse was the first person to get vaccinated in the Brazilian state of Amazonas. The shot came from Chinese company Sinovac. Tests in Brazil found the vaccine was about 78% effective in preventing life-threatening cases of COVID-19 and about 50% effective overall. Not bad, says Sao Paulo University microbiologist Natalia Pasternak. We have a good vaccine. It's not the best vaccine in the world. It's not the perfect vaccine, but it's a good vaccine. But tests elsewhere have been inconsistent. Early data in Turkey show 91% efficacy. In Indonesia, it was 65%. The vaccine's actual efficacy is a mystery because Sinovac has not publicly released the clinical trial results. That's concerning, says Vanderbilt University infectious disease professor William Schaffner. There's an old saying in clinical research, in God we trust, all others must provide data. And we would certainly like to see the data. Another Chinese company, Sinopharm, says its vaccine is 79% effective, but it has not released its data either. Several countries are welcoming the Chinese vaccines anyway at least in part because most other vaccines have been snapped up by wealthier countries. Brazil's Butanon Institute tested the Sinovac vaccine. Director Dimas Kovas says working with the Chinese company was the right move. Because if we hadn't, we wouldn't have millions of doses on the shelves ready to be used. The two Chinese vaccines were made using techniques that have been around for decades. The flu and rabies vaccines are made the same way, but that does not guarantee they are safe and effective for everyone, Schaffner says. We're sure they are effective to some degree. Exactly how effective they are, particularly in older patients, who obviously are the persons who are going to be more severely affected, is something that we'd like to know a great deal more about. Vaccines from drug companies Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech appear to be more effective than the Chinese shots. But those vaccines need to be kept extremely cold. That makes them hard to deliver in many parts of the world, notes Johns Hopkins University vaccine expert William Moss. They're not the ideal vaccine, um, and particularly, you know, for many low- and middle-income countries. The Chinese vaccines are stable at refrigerator temperatures. So, too, is Russia's Sputnik V. Like the Chinese companies, the Russian developers have been criticized for distributing the vaccine without sharing test results. 
But on Tuesday, they published a study in the medical journal The Lancet showing it was more than 91% effective. That puts it in the top tier, Moss says. This is what we wanted to see. This is very encouraging, uh, I think, data and really good for the world to have another vaccine. Welcome news in Argentina, Hungary and elsewhere, where Sputnik V shots are already being given. Steve Barragona, VOA News. President Joe Biden signed a series of immigration actions on Tuesday to reunite migrant children with their parents, restore the asylum system and review changes in the legal immigration system made by the Trump administration. Here's VOA White House correspondent, Axel Ruda-Kusora. At the U.S. southern border with Mexico, thousands of migrant families await their fate. They have been waiting for so long, way over a year, because of the MPP policy that was in place. President Donald Trump's migrant protection protocol sent more than 60,000 asylum seekers from Central American countries to remain in Mexico while their claims are processed in U.S. immigration courts. On Tuesday, President Joe Biden signed executive orders reviewing the program and other Trump immigration policies, including the separation of migrant children. Uh, we're going to work to undo the moral and national shame of the previous administration that literally, not figuratively, ripped children from the arms of their families, the mothers and fathers at the border. At least 5,500 children were separated from their parents by the Trump administration. More than 600 are still waiting to be reunited. Immigration analysts say Biden's actions are a positive first step. But it is important to note that it is more messaging than action. It's going to start a series of actions, which in the end, you know, could have significant changes for immigrants both within and outside of the United States. Uh, but it's going to take significant amount of time. In addition to his executive actions, on his first day in office, Biden sent a bill to Congress that would provide a path to citizenship for an estimated 11 million undocumented immigrants. The bill has drawn criticism from conservative groups. We think this is, frankly, a, a step towards open borders and will uh, increase the incentive for further illegal immigrants in the future to come to the country. And unlike past comprehensive immigration plans, there's really no component of border security. The border wall separating the U.S. and Mexico was Trump's signature policy. Biden has stopped its construction for two months while reviewing what to do next. The yeas are 56, the nays are 43, the nomination is confirmed. Biden appointed Alejandro Mayorkas as his Secretary of Homeland Security, the department that oversees immigration and customs enforcement. Mayorkas, whose parents were Jewish refugees from Cuba, was confirmed by the Senate on Tuesday. Patsy Vidakuswara, VOA News. The dramatic end to Donald Trump's presidency and the upcoming impeachment trial is fracturing the Republican Party. As viewers Elizabeth Lee finds, not everyone who voted for Trump considers themselves a Republican, and not all Republicans consider themselves a Trump supporter. With a new man in the White House, Republicans from across the U.S. reflect on the climactic end of the Trump presidency and what is still to come. I think what happened at the Capitol is inexcusable. 65 kilometers from where protesters stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6 is Haymarket, Virginia. It's the home of Jamaican immigrant Chris Morris, who voted for former President Donald Trump. For those individuals who were there storming the Capitol, I think most of them were doing it mostly for him, to support him. And he has caused our country to be more divided. Walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I Democrats accuse Trump of encouraging the Capitol violence with his continued claims without evidence of a stolen election. Trump's response to the storming of the Capitol? This was a fraudulent election, but we can't play into the hands of these people. We have to have peace. Morris agrees with a few Republican lawmakers who voted against Trump in the impeachment. I think they were feeling the frustration that someone in the position that he had, he did not respond very presidentially. He rolled out his response really weakly. Republican school teacher Aaron Swool from the Midwestern state of Iowa did not vote for Trump. He attributes the attack at the Capitol to angry Trump supporters. Their frustration boiled over and it's almost like that mistake you make when you're angry and you don't think it through. I really think it was more sinister than than that. Trump supporter Deborah Tielger runs a farm in the West Coast state of Washington. I think they did it to, to make him look bad. I believe it was planned. 
by Democrats. Retiree Mary Lynn Clark does not believe the protesters were true Trump supporters. I believe that there could have been some extremists there. We are in a polarizing environment. Christina Morcom from Texas sees parallels between the protest at the Capitol and the Black Lives Matter demonstrations where some people took advantage of the situation to create chaos. Are all those people Trump supporters or are they dressed up as Trump supporters to make Republicans look bad? Like, I think all options are on the table because of the the world we live in right now. I believe that they want to impeach him so that he won't run again to keep him out of office. But I think he's already done that to himself. I don't think that we should seal the coffin on his ability to be part of the government any longer. The different views about Trump and the violence at the Capitol reflect a divided nation and an increasingly divided Republican Party. The GOP is sort of in the middle of what I'm consider what I call a intra-party civil war between more traditional conservatives against the more modern Trumpy people, the populists. But they all believe senators should not vote to convict Trump. Voting for the impeachment is going to further divide our country. And I believe that it, it was a waste of taxpayers' dollars. Nancy Sheets and her husband say it's time for lawmakers to move on and get back to work. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a 100-year-old British man who raised millions of dollars for health workers during the COVID pandemic has died after contracting coronavirus. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Africa 54. After a year in which coronavirus restrictions are causing a slump in diamond exports, Botswana's president says the country needs to diversify its economy. Matthew Larotonda reports. Botswana's president is saying that it's more imperative than ever for the country to diversify its economy after an abysmal year for the diamond market hit government coffers. <laughs> Akwetsi Masisi was speaking at Africa's biggest mining conference called Investing in African Mining in Daba, which is being held online this year. He said Botswana needs to grow in areas such as base metals. Botswana gets about 30% of its revenues from diamond sales via the Debswana Diamond Company, a joint venture with De Beers. But in 2020, the South African nation closed its borders for eight months of the year as a part of lockdown measures. Botswana, which produces almost all of Botswana's diamonds, saw exports fall by 30 percent, according to statistics released on Friday by the Bank of Botswana. Msisi said the country is also aiming to develop other minerals, including its estimated 212 billion tons of coal. He says the government was talking to its neighbors about developing an infrastructure to export the fossil fuel. Matthew Larotonda of Reuters filed that report. Captain Tom Moore, a 100-year-old British Second World War veteran who raised millions of dollars for health workers and offered hope to Britons and others worldwide during the COVID-19 pandemic, died Tuesday, days after contracting the virus. Henry Ridgewell reports from London. A humble World War II veteran who raised millions of dollars for charity and lifted a nation's spirits in its time of need. In April 2020, at the height of the coronavirus pandemic, former Army Captain Tom Moore set out to raise money for the National Health Service by walking a hundred laps of his garden, inspired by the treatment he'd received for a broken hip and cancer. The world took Moore to their hearts and the donations poured in. Troops from his home Yorkshire regiment formed an honour guard for the 100th lap, 
by which time Moore had raised more than $16 million. It's unbelievable that people would be so kind to give that source of money to the National Health Service, and maybe I, I was responsible for starting it, but not, not deliberately. It was <laughs> purely gratitude for what they've done for me. He didn't stop there. Moore kept on walking. By the time he closed the donation page on April 30th, his 100th birthday, Moore had raised a staggering $53 million. He received 150,000 birthday cards from around the world. Others took inspiration for their own fundraising endeavors, raising millions of dollars more for charity. In July, Captain Moore was knighted by Queen Elizabeth. His regiment promoted him to honorary colonel. In September, he released an autobiography, the title taken from his iconic words, tomorrow will be a good day. Well, what can you do? I mean, I, I think, as far as I'm concerned, always be optimistic, whatever you're talking about, be optimistic, because it's a good day. I mean, things will get better. In recent weeks, Moore was being treated for pneumonia and was diagnosed with the coronavirus in January. The 100-year-old passed away Tuesday after a short stay in the hospital. Captain Tom's passing has triggered an outpouring of grief and admiration. I think everyone is sort of feeling it because that's so many people have lost someone that they're, they're connecting with that. Thank you so much, Captain Tom. It's a massive, massive thing you've done for the country. Thank you, Captain Tom. Captain Sir Tom Moore was a hero in the truest sense of the word. In a statement, Moore's family said, the last year of our father's life was nothing short of remarkable. He was rejuvenated and experienced things he had only ever dreamed of. Moore will be remembered most for his messages of hope. To all those people who are finding it difficult at the moment, he said, the sun will shine on you again and the clouds will go away. Henry Ridgewell, for VOA News, London. A Russian court has sentenced opposition politician Alexei Navalny to serve out the remaining time of a 3.5-year suspended sentence in a prison colony. The decision comes just weeks after Navalny returned to Russia following a poisoning attack that nearly took his life. From Moscow, Charles Mains reports. As the judge read the verdict, Alexei Navalny signaled a goodbye to his wife. The anti-corruption crusader is now headed to a penal colony for nearly three years, barring the unforeseen. The court found that he violated his parole from a 2014 suspended sentence on charges of embezzlement and appeared to put no weight on evidence his absence was due to treatment abroad following a near-fatal poison attack or that Europe's Court of Human Rights found the earlier conviction baseless. Navalny's lawyer vowed the legal fight would continue. We will appeal the verdict and inform ministers from the Council of Europe that Russia is not fulfilling its obligations to the European court. Cameras were banned from most of the proceedings, but in a fiery speech before the court, Navalny insisted that having failed to poison him to death, President Vladimir Putin was now trying to silence him in prison. The Kremlin denies both charges. Outside, police blocked access to the courthouse, supporting efforts by supporters to rally ahead of the verdict. After Tuesday, others tried to march near the Kremlin, and again, they met with overwhelming force. Navalny's detention upon his return to Russia last month has sparked protests across the country and a police crackdown. No comment from Russian police on arrest figures, but an independent rights group says at least 10,000 people have been detained nationwide, sparking international condemnation. A new Navalny video investigation alleging corruption by the Russian president seems to have escalated the conflict between Putin and the opposition leader. Despite Kremlin denials of its veracity, the video has amassed over 100 million views online. A government spokesman said President Putin was paying little attention to Tuesday's courtroom drama, but few observers doubt the verdict reflects a political decision made at the very top, one that risks kicking off further unrest and turning Navalny and even more of a symbol in the fight against Russian state oppression. Charles Maines for VOA News, Moscow.
Israel has begun exporting fruits, vegetables, olive oil, and wine to the United Arab Emirates under the terms of a U.S. broker peace agreement. Some of the Israeli producers are based in the West Bank, which Palestinians claim as part of a future Palestinian state. Linda Bradstein reports from Jerusalem. Jewish settlement leader Israel Gans looks out over the West Bank Hills, which he calls by the biblical name Judea and Samaria, and where wine has been made for thousands of years. Wine is it's the only fruit that you can uh, taste the, the ground here. And, and here in Judea and Samaria, we have so deep roots. You can feel the ground, you can feel the roots of the history. And this made, uh, this make the best wine for all over the world. The history, the tradition, and the ground, the holy land ground. The winery of the Jewish settlement of Psagot, just a few kilometers from the Palestinian city of Ramallah, will soon begin exporting wine to the United Arab Emirates. Winemaker Yaakov Berg welcomes the peace agreement with the UAE called the Abraham Accords and cites Abraham as the common ancestor of both Jews and Arabs. We live in the same, let's call it the same neighborhood. When my neighbor came to me, first, first thing I gave him my wine. You know, in, in the Jewish tradition, Abraham represents tent in the middle of nowhere, open to everybody. Every guest can come in. When Psagot's wine is exported to Europe, the EU labels it made in the West Bank. But in the UAE, settlement products will simply be labeled made in Israel, a move that angers some Palestinians. I actually think the UAE is uh, embracing anything to do with this right-wing Israeli administration to appease the United States. Uh, they've already made the first jump, which is the normalization agreement itself. And I think once that took place, they have, they have gone overboard in trying to make sure they show the Americans that they have no hesitation whatsoever to support the U.S.'s main ally in the region, Israel. Since the Abraham Accords were signed in September, 150,000 Israelis have visited the Emirates. Business deals worth hundreds of millions of dollars have been signed. And what we're seeing with, these, with the forming of these relations with the UAE, for instance, is that um, un the understanding that at the end of the day, business is business. And if there is a good product which comes from Israel and uh, there is a market interest for this, so be it. UAE markets are enthusiastic about Israeli exports, including those from the West Bank settlements. And there is even talk of establishing a road link to transport Israeli goods to the UAE. Israeli officials say these are signs that trade will continue to expand despite the international boycott campaign supported by the Palestinians. Linda Gradstein for VOA News in Psagot on the West Bank. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at viewafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, we thank you for watching.